On this week in Enterprise Tech, it's the dynamic duo. That's right, Mr. Brian Chi and I are here. And this week we talk about how the move to HTTPS has been bumpy. But the question is, are we done yet? Did we get there? We'll definitely talk about it. Now, no code and low code platforms have kick started a revolution for organizations to digitally transform their processes and workflow. Now, this week we have Chris Beatty, CIO of ServiceNow. He's going to talk about just how low code solutions have impacted organizations and how they're securing their data and just how challenging things are for CIOs alike. You shouldn't miss it. Twilight on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt. This week in Enterprise Tech, episode 463, recorded October 1st, 2021. Low code pundits. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by. IT Pro TV. The IT world needs cybersecurity more than ever, along with qualified people to fill its roles. Get your cybersecurity certs with IT Pro TV. Visit itpro.tv slash enterprise for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code enterprise30 at checkout. And by Worldwide Technology. With an innovative culture, thousands of IT engineers, application developers, unmatched labs and integration centers for testing and deploying technology at scale, WWT helps customers bridge the gap between strategy and execution. To learn more about WWT, visit WWT.com slash twit. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guide through this big world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in a professional, an expert in their field to help us guide the way. And today we have a dynamic duel. That's right. It's I as well as Mr. Brian Chi. He is an architect at Sky Fiber, and he's the all-around tech geek, Chibert. How are you, my friend? What's keeping you busy? I'm doing good. I'm actually tinkering with this um, new VPN service called Speedify. And Ooh. the idea is you can actually hook up multiple WAN connections and it'll do a round robin load balancing so that out, you know uploads can actually be faster than your any single connection. So I'm going to try and see about building a nice little appliance so that if you're someplace where, say, LTE is only so-so, we can bond multiple LTE modems together and still give you enough upload bandwidth so you can stream HD video. Ought to be fun. Very cool. Very cool. Now you've been helping me. Uh, I've uh, We've all found out that Wi-Fi 6 systems, not all of them are created equal. And uh, I've had some issues with my latest mess service, so we're I'm going to try to uh, to move over to a little bit more business like services. See how that goes. Maybe we should uh, eventually do a, a segment on that and just how how we set up systems and uh, which ones are good and, and bad in specific situations. It might be a good segment. Yeah, you bet. We especially we should do a segment on how to do heat maps. Because those Ooh. can answer an awful lot of questions, and there's some decent software out there that doesn't cost a whole lot of money or no money. So, ought right. to be fun. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, speaking of interesting, we have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about today, so we should definitely get started. Now, you know, we've talked about it before, the move to HTTPS. It's been quite a bumpy road. The question is, are we done yet? Did we get there? Well, we'll, we'll definitely talk about it, what's going on there. Plus, you know, no code and low code platforms, they've actually really kickstarted a revolution for organizations and they've helped them digitally transform their processes and their workflows, especially now during the pandemic. Today, we have Chris Beatty, CIO of ServiceNow. We're going to talk about just how low code solutions are actually impacting organizations and how they're securing their data and just how challenging it is for CIOs alike. So sit tight. We have lots more to talk about. But before we do, we have to jump into this week's news blips. 
Now, crypto exchanges continue to be the targets of for the world's threat actors. Now, crypto exchange Coinbase disclosed that a threat actor stole cryptocurrency from 6,000 customers after using a vulnerability to bypass the company's SMS multi-factor authentication security feature. Now, if that's not evidence enough that you shouldn't be using SMS uh, as an MFA portion, then, uh, you know, maybe a current cryptocurrency might be able to convince you there. Now, Coinbase is the world's second largest cryptocurrency exchange with approximately 68 million users for over 100 countries. Now, in a notification sent to the affected customers this week, Coinbase explains that between March and May 20th of 2021, a threat actor conducted a hacking campaign to breach Coinbase customer accounts and steal their cryptocurrency. Now, to, con- to actually conduct this attack, Coinbase says that attackers needed to know the customer's email address, password, and phone number associated with their Coinbase account and have access to the victim's email account as well. Now, While it's unknown how the threat actors gained access to this information, Coinbase believes this is through a phishing campaign targeting Coinbase customers to steal account credentials, which have become common. And once they learned of the attack, Coinbase stated that they actually fixed the SMS account recovery protocols to prevent any further bypassing of that multi-factor authentication portion of it. Now, since the attack required the password of both customers, Coinbase, and email account, it is strongly recommended that victims change their password immediately on both systems. And in fact, Coinbase also recommends users switch to a more secure MFA method. I as well recommend that. That, such as a hardware security key or authentication application. Finally, victims should be on the lookout for future targeted phishing emails or SMS texts that attempt to steal credentials using information exposed in their breach. Well, this news story warms the cockles of my heart, um, I hope. So Merck announced in a potential leap forward in the global fight against the pandemic. Drug maker Merck said this last Friday that its experimental pill for people sick with COVID-19 reduced hospitalizations and deaths by half. This could add a whole new easy to use weapon to an arsenal that already includes the COVID-19 vaccine. The company says it will soon ask health officials in the US and around the world to authorize the pill's use. A decision from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration could come within weeks after that, and the drug, if it gets the okay, could be distributed quickly soon after. What this potentially means to organizations around the world is having a tool in our quiver to potentially reduce the effects of the COVID-19 virus and potentially give management another option. I think this is especially nice for individuals that have a medical reason for not being able to get vaccinated. I, for one, would really love to have a Tamiflu-like antiviral for like the Tamiflu antiviral for influenza so that I have an option if I find myself at a meeting or conference with a flare-up, which is, I'm sure, going to happen. Well, for instance, my doctor allowed me to use Tamiflu as a prophylactic, you know, pre-medication. So I would take a half a dose um, continuously while I was attending giant conferences like CES or you know wherever. And the problem with giant conferences and other large meetings is almost guaranteed someone's going to be sick. And I have, year in, year out, I have caught the the conference flu or the con, con crud, as Padre would say. And being able to take a prophylactic made a lot of sense. So I'm hoping that one, the Merck pills become available very soon so that we can deal with people that can't be vaccinated. Um, People that won't, won't vaccinated. That's entire thing that I'm not going to say anything about, but as in-person conferences start to happen, having the option for a pill based antiviral makes my heart leap for joy. Now, chip makers continue to target specialized silicon for machine learning and AI, while Intel is working hard to ensure they continue to stay on top of that competitive stack. Despite their name, neural networks are only distantly related 
to the sort of things you find in a brain. Now, while the organization and the way we transfer data through layers of processing may share some rough similarities in networks of actual neurons, the data and the computations performed on it will look very familiar to a standard CPU. But neural networks aren't the only way that people have tried to take lessons from the nervous system. There's a separate discipline called neuromorphic computing that's based on approximating the behavior of individual neurons in hardware. And neuromorphic hardware calculations are performed by lots of small units that communicate with each other through bursts of activity called spikes and adjust their behavior based on the spikes they receive from others. Now this week, Intel released the newest iteration of its neuromorphic hardware called Loa Ihi. Now the new release comes with the sorts of things you expect from Intel, a better processor and some basic computational enhancements, but it also comes with some fundamental hardware changes that will allow it to run entirely new classes of algorithms. And while this new platform remains a research focused product for now, Intel is also releasing a compiler that hopes it will derive wider adoption coming soon. So GM is starting to get on the bandwagon. And I mean bandwagon in this case as an EV600 electric delivery van. In January, General Motors created a new electric vehicle brand. It's called Bright Drop. And like GM's legacy brands that are electrifying it too, we'll use the company's forthcoming Altium batteries and Altium drive electric motors. Unlike the rest of GM's brands, this one is aimed squarely at the fleet market. At the time, GM CEO Mary Barra revealed that FedEx would be Bright Drop's first customer. This last Tuesday, Bright Drop announced that Verizon will also start using the electric vans. In fact, Verizon will be using a second Bright Drop vehicle called the EV410. This uses the same battery pack and motor as the EV600 that we've they saw in FedEx colors at the start of the year, but it'll also, also offer the same 250 mile or 402 kilometer range and come with the same package of safety systems. The biggest difference is the size and amount of cargo each can carry. The EV410 is a shorter overall than the EV600 and can carry 410 cubic feet versus the bigger van 600 cubic feet. Since deliveries are typically very stop and go in nature, electric just makes a ton of sense, especially considering delivery routes tend to be quite short. Combine that with dramatically reduced maintenance for vehicles that tend to sit half the time, and you have a great way to reduce smog and noise in larger cities and just uh, be better for the environment. Love it. <laughs> Well, when the world still used HTTP without utilizing modern encryption techniques, monitoring traffic was actually quite easy. That's right, a lot of sniffers out there. Now, if malware or spam rolled into the network, it could be easily detected and even blocked. However, HTTPS has become even more prevalent due to some browsers enforcing it. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But organizations that have not implemented controls for detecting malware hidden in encrypted network traffic are at risk of having a vast majority of malicious tools being distributed in the wild, hitting their endpoint devices. Now, a study of threat activity conducted by WatchGuard Technologies using anonymized data gathered from customer networks showed that 91.5% of malware detections in the second quarter of 2021 involved malware riot arriving over HTTPS encrypted connections. Now, only 20% of organizations currently having mechanisms for decrypting and scanning that traffic for malware. That's pretty low. Now, that means that the remaining 80% are at the risk of missing nine tenths of, of the malware hitting their networks daily. Now, that's quite a bit of malware and almost like you open the front door and let the malware walk right in. Now, WatchGuard's analysis, for instance, show the number of script based and or fileless attacks in the first six months of this year alone had already reached 80% of the total for all of 2020. That's quite a bit. Now, data from the last quarter suggested that the fileless malware is on track to double in volume this year compared to 20, 2020. Now, you may, may be asking yourself, why aren't organizations actually setting this up for themselves? Well, part of it is that there's actually a large complexity to setting it all up. For a man in the middle uh, decryption to work, 
without messing up the security of the HTTPS certificates that secure the traffic, you have to set up an intermediate or root CA certificate that is part of the official certificate verification process. Now, the truth of the matter is the organizations increasingly need detection technologies like this or like machine learning or, or even machine learning models and behavioral analysis that actually can proactively detect malware that looks new without having to wait for AV vendors to publish new signatures. Now, network attackers, meanwhile, continue to pound away on servers and services that are still at the office or in the cloud. Now, several security researchers have noted that how many of these servers and services somewhat less protected than before because more employees, including information security staffers out there, are working from home. Now, that means it is more important than ever to start auditing your security posture and ensure that your network has even the most foundational protections against attackers today. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week Enterprise Tech, and that's IT Pro TV. Cybersecurity is one of, if not the most vital aspects of IT. Now, the tech world needs these roles filled with qualified individuals, and IT Pro TV is the place to do just that. Start your IT career today with IT Pro TV. Learn IT and get certified for the many IT jobs around the world. Now, with seven studios and over 1,500 hours of IT training, nobody does it better like IT Pro TV. Now, it's a spooky month at IT Pro TV for October. This month is jam packed with events focused on cybersecurity. Now, check out the webinar on October 7th. It's called Protecting Against Mobile Security Threats in a BYOD Environment. Plus, there's also a webinar on October 20th. It's Halloween themed. I like that. CyberSec incident response for small businesses avoiding the nightmare on Main Street. You can find out more info at itpro.tv slash webinars. Now, there's also a panel discussion on October 14th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Dirty Little Secrets of Cybersecurity Career featuring three IT security experts moderated by Don Puzzet. And there's more info on the IT Pro TV YouTube channel. Participate in their free weekend. It's October 23rd to 24th. As a special for this month's theme, the following courses will be part of the IT Pro TV free membership. You have CompTIA Security Plus, CEH, CompTIA CISA Plus, and CISSP. Now, IT Pro TV's edutainers make learning IT interesting and fun. You'll get the most up-to-date information while preparing for exams, including brand new content from the studio to their course library within 24 hours. Courses are divided into 20 to 30 minute episodes with searchable transcripts. Plus, the edutainers on staff and are available every day if you need their assistance and learn anytime from the comfort of your home on your own schedule. Now, the IT world needs qualified cybersecurity professionals more more than ever, get your cybersecurity certs with IT Pro TV. Visit itpro.tv slash enterprise for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code enterprise30. That's itpro.tv slash enterprise and use code enterprise30 for additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. And we thank IT Pro TV for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. Now, we've talked about HTTPS quite a bit in the past. It's becoming more prevalent due to browsers starting to bring that protocol to make it be default for all public sites. Well, last week, the Electronic Foundation or F Frontier Foundation announced that it will deprecate its HTTPS Everywhere browser plugin in 2022. Now, I, you probably had that installed. I know I had. Now, the EFF originally launched that plugin uh, that automatically upgrades the HTTP connections to HTTPS in 2010 as a stopgap measure for a world that was still getting accustomed to the idea of encrypting all of its web browser traffic. Now, when the new plugin was new, the majority of the internet was still served up by plain text vulnerabilities, and obviously that making it more vulnerable to both snooping and manipulating by an entity that could actually place itself between a web browser user and a web user, a server that communicated with it. A lot of man in the middle attacks there. Now, even banking websites frequently offered unencrypted connections, which is actually fairly scary. Now, thankfully, the web encryption landscape has changed dramatically in the last 11 years since then. 
Now we can get some idea of just how the protocol has come by looking at HTTPS Archive's state of web report. In fact, in 2016, six years after that plugin was out there, the HTTPS Archive recorded encrypted connections for fewer than one site in every four and crawled. That's pretty good. Actually, pretty good, uh, pretty good increase there. Now, in the five years since then, the number has actually skyrocketed. As of July, the Archive crawls nine of every ten sites with HTTPS. Now, although the increase was organic and HTTPS was starting to be adopted. It actually was influenced by this plugin for sure. But more importantly, automated upgrades from HTTP to HTTPS is now available natively in all four major consumer browsers, including the new edge that's out there for Microsoft, Apple, Safari, Google Chrome, and of course, Mozilla's Firefox as well. Unfortunately, Safari is still the only mainstream browser to force HTTPS traffic by default. What, which has likely informed the FS decision to retire its uh, HTTPS everywhere. Um, now, Firefox and Chrome offer a native HTTPS mode, which must be user enabled, and uh, Edge actually offers an experimental mode that you can enable as well. If you'd like to enable this particular functionality, go choose your browser, find that particular step, and go and enable it today. I definitely do, and I actually enable it on all of my browsers. So definitely go do that, for, especially for your mobile devices as well. Now, Brian, I want to bring you in here because, you know, obviously we've talked about this before. I, I feel like this is a great step forward. Um, I, I, I like how a lot of the browsers are starting to for, enforce this. But this is not the only security risk, right? I mean, this is obviously just the tip of the iceberg. We've talked a lot about some other ones that are out there that organizations should be paying attention to as well. What other things should organizations be doing outside this? Well, I, I, I'm going to beat the IoT band, band again because <laughs> there, there's a real big problem. Um, if your browser supports it, great, but the back end needs to be there too, right? You know, So mm -hmm. unfortunately, a lot of IoT devices are based on absolutely ancient versions of Apache, and uh, that needs to change. But I'll tell you, the EFF has done an amazing job of moving the pointer towards getting things secured. Now, we really need to have things like um, secure DNS. <clears throat> In fact, that tells, that reminds me, I really need to go and schedule Cricket Lou back onto the show so we can go and dive deep into some of the issues in secure DNS and maybe we can get some interesting insight. But we need to do things. Um, one of the things that I keep telling people a lot is HTTPS is a truly wonderful technology. We don't have, you know, this isn't you know, say 10 years ago, where you didn't, you, your CPUs didn't have enough horsepower. So you running encryption meant you had to have a special network interface card and able to handle the encryption. That's just not the case anymore. So there's no excuse. We really, everything should be running HTTPS. We should not be running unencrypted anything. And I, t I tell people one little story. Um, there, there's a story that I heard about the French resistance during World War II. <clears throat> and even though there were messages that they would need to send between, you know, groups of resistance fighters that didn't need to be in the clear, uh, didn't need to be encrypted or didn't need to be, you know, codified, they sent everything. Same thing with the U.S. Army and so forth. And the reason why is if you suddenly don't encrypt something, um, it becomes very easy to find out what's valuable and what's not. And that's kind of the attitude I heard when I was talking to some of the EFF people. Encrypt everything. It just makes sense. We have the hardware to do it. Um, we really ought to be. So, end soapbox. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that you brought that up, actually, because I, I do know a lot of individuals. Uh, I've talked to a lot of organizations out there uh, and a lot of them still feel like that. Like they, if they enable HTTPS, it could cause performance degradation um, in their in their uh, in their, you know, in their network and in their pro in their, their their endpoints and their servers and stuff. Um, I find it interesting that they haven't done the research to find out that that was the old style of way encryption used to work. And nowadays things are a lot easier. Um, and the, you know, the new process means you only have to, you know, in, enforce it once, decrypt it once. Um, and, and, and away you go. Now, 
I, the handshake actually only happens once. So I think, you know, I, I'm actually interested to see why this happens. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. I, I, I know a lot of organizations that I've worked with in the past where a lot of their public facing sites are, are HTTPS. But when you get internal uh, and you, you end up accessing, I don't know, let's say, you know, an IT site or something, it's still um, it's still HTTP. So I guess the question to you is, should organizations be encrypting everything, including even some of their internal sites? I would like to say yes. Um, but the sad, the sad thing that I've been finding out is, gee, um, there's still a lot of misinformation going around. Oh, oh, I, I have to buy a commercial crypto key in order to, um, you know, get things going internally. Uh, oh, and I have to have an internet connection so that I can go to the certificate authority. No, not really. Um, it, it works. You know, you can, heck, even if you do a self, you know, a roll your own crypto key on your web server, that's still better than nothing. Don't you, you know, I, I'm, maybe you agree, maybe you don't. Um, but again, you know, there's an awful lot of old webcams. There's an awful lot of old network attached storage, you know, other IOT devices that are on old Apache or old Linux. And that's my, that's sticks in my throat. I, I'd like that to happen. I'd like them to be able to do encrypted connections no matter what. Um, I think if even the internal stuff gets encrypted, that'll be good. Now, I'll, here's my justification. A lot of the attacks aren't coming from the aren't coming from the outside. A lot of attacks are actually because someone right. clicked on a link. Where does that happen? Now that's inside, right? So when I ran my big firewall bake off, I ran the attacks as if they're coming from the outside, but I also ran the attacks as if, you know, little Johnny or little Jane brought in their laptop and plugged it in in dad's office. And now all of a sudden let's lose a virus. So that sounds like a really good reason to have encrypted sites inside too, doesn't it? I agree. I agree. Now there is a challenge here. Um, I've actually worked with organizations. A lot of them have a ton of sites out there and these SSL certs, they expire. They go out of, you know, obviously expire over time. And um, especially if you're enforcing this uh, in traffic today, if they expire, you lose connection to your server. People can't access your server anymore, whether it's your, your website or your service or whatnot. And so I'm actually seeing a big challenge, especially in DevOps, is when you deploy, you actually have to continually verify you know, whether it's a smoke test or it's actually alerting or some tooling that's out there to verify that these certs are you know, not going to expire anytime soon. And if they are, you make sure you have a good enough buffer to go and get a new one, a new, a, a new uh, cert that, uh, that's actually out there uh, that's renewed. Because otherwise, you're, you know, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Uh, especially when your traffic goes down to zero and you have to scramble in the middle of the night to get yourself a new cert. Um, I, I'm guessing, what I'm going to guess is say, hey, that's probably why a lot of organizations internally, they tend to not do it. So they have to manage all those certs internally. But I still think, like you said, it's, 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 it's much better practice to do that because like you said, a lot of the attacks happen from sleepers on the inside of the network. And if, if you're going to let them listen to traffic, um, on side of your, inside of your network, uh, you know that's going to make it a lot easier for them to to find things, whether it's passwords or or credentials or data from users or whatnot. And so let's make it harder for them. Let's let's encrypt everything uh, if we can. It's not going to cost you much more. Um, and and hopefully you got the processes in place. Now, Brian, I want to throw one more thing out to you because I know you've been talking about this a lot. You talked about IoT, and the challenge here is a lot of IoT devices. You know, you still they still do not connect using HTTPS because of the same problem, because of the fact that these certs expire over time. And if they have web servers built into them, like for instance, you know, I have a light switch that has a mini, mini web server built into it. Um, the Orbi that I had uh, recently had a web server built into so you can access the, uh, the, the backend, didn't use HTTP. Yes. Um, in fact, um, the, the, software, the software controller from Ubiquity I used to use on my machine here, you didn't use HTTPS either, um, unless you set it up manually. So th there's a lot of reasons why we should be moving forward. But do you think that we should be forcing things like IoT and other devices doing to, to do this going forward? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm optimistic. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, so one of the things that some of my old students that work for Infoblox were talking about, um, for the life of me, I can't remember what it's called anymore. We actually did a show on it. It's a DNS where you actually can put into your um, your DNS entry for your individual device your your keys. Um, mm -hmm. That way, instead of having to go to a key authority, if you control the DNS domain, you can stick your crypto keys in that. And that way your your validation is happening closer to you. Um, something like that would be really cool. Um, but the downside is that re that means we have to have DNSSEC. And the sad reality is, is DNSSEC um, adoption is still really low. And um, a lot of things depend on having that adoption to be in place. So maybe the Electronic F uh, Frontier Foundation needs to now set their sights on DNSSEC. What do you think, man? DNSSEC, yo. <laughs> <laughs> we need a t-shirt like that. We need to get a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I oh, heart good. DNSSEC. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thanks, Cheever. Well, I think that does it for the bites because we, we have a lot more to talk about here in the rest of the show. We have a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. But before we get to our guests, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that's WWT Worldwide Technology. WWT is at the forefront of innovation, working with clients all over the world to transform their businesses. Now, at the heart of WWT lies their advanced technology center, their ATC. We talked about this a lot. And the ATC is a research and testing lab that brings together technologies from leading OEMs. There's more than a half a billion dollars in equipment invested in this lab. Now, the ATC offers hundreds of on-demand and schedulable labs representing the newest advances in multi-cloud architecture, security, networking, primary and secondary storage, data analytics, and AI, DevOps, and so much more. Now, WWT's engineers and partners use the ATC to quickly spin up proofs of concept and pilots to customers so can confidently select the best solutions. Now, this helps cut evaluation time from months down to weeks. Now, with the ATC, you can test out products and solutions before you go to market. Now, access technical articles, expert insights, demonstration videos, white papers, hands-on labs, and other tools to help you stay up to date with the latest technology. Now, not only is the ATC a physical lab space, but WWT has also virtualized it. That's right, members of their ATC platform can access these amazing resources anywhere in the world, 365 days a year. Now, while exploring the ATC platform, make sure to check out WWT's events and communities for more opportunities to learn about technology trends and hear the latest research and insights from their experts. Whatever your business needs, WWT can deliver scalable, tried and tested, tailored solutions. WWT brings strategy and execution together to make a new world happen. To learn more about WWT, the ATC, and gain access to their free resources, visit WWT.com slash twit and create a free account on their ATC platform. That's WWT.com slash twit. And we thank Worldwide Technology for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on, on the Twilight Riot. And today we have Chris Beatty. He's the CIO of ServiceNow. Welcome to the show, Chris. Great to be here, Lou. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. Can you take us through a short journey to, te to tech and actually what brought you to uh, ServiceNow? Sure, absolutely, and I'll try to keep it brief. So I'm a computer engineer by education, graduated University of Michigan, and right out of school, I joined uh, KPMG Consulting. It's a great experience working with a variety of clients across a lot of different industries, really helping out um, with their own global transformations. And then from there, I, I joined industry. That's a term we use when we're in consulting. I joined VeriSign, internet security company, had a great time there in and outside of IT. I spent some time in HR, in corporate development. Um, you know, when I, my last role there was the CIO. And from then on went to uh, JDSU, a, a hardware company uh, out of the Silicon Valley as well. And then been at ServiceNow for the past six years as ServiceNow's global CIO. And it's been really, really fun 
um, from when I joined ServiceNow, very much a company that focused on helping IT organizations at our customers, you know, get higher efficiency, better speed, better experiences for their employees to really a company today that serves 80% of the Fortune 500 and, and helps out with all of digital transformation, whether it's optimizing the customer experience, the customer operations that support it, employee experiences, certainly haven't forgotten our roots in IT and our topic at hand today, low code, no code. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think that it's just interesting because no code, low code is definitely a revolution that's out there, but it's definitely changed the landscape with how people are handling data, how they're considering security, that kind of thing. Now, you talked a lot about becoming a CIO and, and kind of stepping into that role. Can you maybe give the the audience a little bit of uh, insights into just how maybe your role has changed over time, especially in the last couple of years with the pandemic going on? Sure. The pandemic has certainly added what I'll call jet fuel to it, but the trend existed even pre pandemic, which is, you know, digital transformation. And it gets kind of buzzwordy, but the reality is every company is trying to transform itself. And I, and I think I'll break it up into two. Um, there's digital transformation, which is focused on underneath the existing revenue model, the existing business model. How do I transform my operations? How do I get more speed, more productivity, a better, a talent advantage for the company, which is all predicated on tech. And then there's another part of digital transformation, which is the creation of new digital business models, new digital services to serve the customer in different way, either to monetize it or simply to create a competitive advantage. But the common thread across all of it is it's all powered by tech. And so with this tech, you know, the pressure or the responsibility on the CIO is increasing at, at light speed. And so I think the role has evolved in terms of more responsibility for sure. But I think it's, it's more fun because there's more challenges to solve. And I just love solving problems. Right, right. Yeah, I definitely feel like obviously, you know, the more technology you implement and ingest, the more you have to go figure out solutions, you have to figure out automated solutions, uh, managed solutions, that kind of thing. Now, do you find that, you know, now that you've kind of slightly evolved in this role over time, that you're actually collaborating more with different other leaders, maybe even um, around the hybrid workforce and the experience around there where, you know, they're actually experiencing the same thing and, and you have to make sure that that collaboration is there. Oh, for sure. I think the CIO absolutely has to almost swivel chair multiple times um, a day into working across the C-suite. You mentioned hybrid work and the first principle there being employee safety with the pandemic. But right. what's, what's happening is we're looking at work when, and work as opposed to a destination, someplace you go to something you do. And how do we help the talent that exists in all of our organizations to really work from anywhere, which means we need to digitize a lot of workflows, which were manual before. And when someone does go to the office, um, how do they reserve a space? How do they know who else is there? How do they collaborate seamlessly with some people in the office, some people remote, um, et cetera? So that's really um, first and foremost, or, or really important right now as part of C-suite agenda. But when I mentioned that swivel chair concept, that might be one conversation in the morning. The next one might be partnering with the chief marketing officer to say, how do we use technology to reach our customers in a different way to drive pipeline or growth? And the third conversation might be with the CFO to say, how do we optimize all of our internal operations? Um, so. I think definitely the collaboration across the C-suite. Um, but there's one thing I'd, I'd like to highlight, which is, as I said, everything is predicated on tech. I think the responsibility of any tech organization needs to become not chasing the latest fad, but really implementing tech that's going to make a difference for the enterprise and drive real business results. 
Yeah, I like that. I think obviously anything that's going to impact the organization and uh, for the better. You, know, you talked a little about uh, working with different individuals on the C suite and, and different, you know, organizations within uh, or different parts of the organization. Um, you know, I, I've actually seen a lot of organizations out there start to digitally transform, actually using low code solutions for um, for new hire intake and and actually people who are coming in as new hires. That whole process of you know obviously managing um, you know what the, the hardware and the the, the software that they get when they first start and and managing who their mentor is and who they need to connect to, getting their badge, that kind of thing. The whole process is actually pretty challenging. Um, and I actually seen a lot of organizations start to do that, especially because they're doing it more remote now. Uh, and there's nobody like on site to actually help them out. Now, are you seeing new processes spin up um, because of this, that maybe even inventing new processes in a, in a low code uh, solution and integrating to existing databases, especially during the pandemic because of this? Yeah, absolutely, Lou. And I'll pick up on onboarding. So we at ServiceNow, we onboarded 3,000 people during the pandemic and all virtually, all completely digital. And through a mobile app, they're able to engage with the company prior to joining, you know, do all the legal stuff, take the required training, tell us what their technology preferences are, but also connect with teammates, right? Assigning them a buddy. And then that digital journey continuing once they join the company into a ramp up journey, which is different for a salesperson versus an engineer versus someone in IT. And I think that's critical that we digitally enable everything. But I think that's kind of like the tip of the iceberg in terms of use cases around low code, no code, because the industry has been talking about low code, no code forever. And, and like, why now? What's different? And I'll attribute it to a couple of things. I, met, I talked about digitally, digital transformation and how it's not optional for companies. It's a necessity in terms of transforming themselves. The second is if you think about the talent entering the workforce and in the organizations today, and I think I read an estimate that about 40% of the workforce today is equipped to start to partake in low code, no code. but. That talent wants to have a role. They want to be empowered to digitize their own work, make work better for themselves. They don't want to, you know, file a request with IT and get in line like you would at a deli counter or something like that. Like, I'm equipped. Give me the tools. I'm ready to go. And I think companies that lean into this are going to create a talent advantage for themselves because people want to be empowered. Now, it's interesting. Let, let, let's kind of roll into this side of things. Obviously, we we see a lot. You're saying, hey, we attract talent that want to be able to self-service themselves and be able to automate things and, you know, create more workflows and more automated things. Now, obviously, when we say no code, not a lot of there's no code. You basically go in there, you build you build out your workflow and there's not much needed to do there. Now, when you have a low code solution, you build out your workflow using the same tools, but then you got to go in and you add some customization in there. So you do need to know a little bit of programming. Is is this going to be maybe a new, when you're hiring new people, uh, a, a skill that you're looking for? Obviously, some that m- will be able to, to learn how to do that type of logic and to be able to customize those solutions? I think so. And a couple of things are going to happen. Um, I think on the platform side, it's going to become simpler and simpler to where even as you get into more complex scenarios, it'll be abstracted enough so you don't have to be a programmer to do it. And, and, and let me give you maybe a simple example of, we had a process at our company where there was, it was all orchestrated via email and Excel spreadsheets, where how do we decide if something's newsworthy or press release worthy? And we had someone in marketing, no coding experience, literally build an app in 12 hours to take that whole workflow based process with a bunch of business rules in it, who it should route to for approval based upon the type of press release, et cetera. And, and she built it in 12 hours and Oof. that cut the cycle time from these approvals down to like two, three weeks down to like four or five hours. And, and think about how many use cases there are like that things that are trapped in email or Excel that don't need a whole lot of complex programming but can unlock so much speed across the enterprise. I think, I think like there's so much opportunity out there and, and the tools and the platforms are going to get easier and easier for the average person to do it. 
See, now I like how you reference Excel because I actually work for the Excel team. So I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Well, when we come back, we have a lot more to talk about here because there's obviously, you know, there's revolutions happening in this space. There's evolutions. So we definitely want to get deeper into the low code, no code solutions and just how it's transforming the organizations. But before we do, we do have, I think, another great sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech, and that is Bitwarden. Now, Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go, and it's trusted by millions. Empower your employees to follow password management best practices. Now, with Bitwarden, you can securely store credentials across personal and business worlds, and every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of of a personal vault. Use your Bitwarden for business because it's fully customizable. Adjust features using enterprise policies to actually adapt to business needs. Use Bitwarden Send. It's a fully encrypted method to transmit sensitive information, whether it's text or files directly to anyone. And team members can generate unique and secure passwords for every site. And you'll get enterprise grade security and they are GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA, and SOC 2 compliant. And their end to end encrypted vault helps m mitigate phishing attacks by storing passwords and more. Now, Bitwarden now has new tools for managed service providers as well. Now, Bitwarden's new provider portal allows MSPs to easily manage clients' password management services all in one place. It allows for simple access to each separate organization. And there are two new user types allowed for delegation of management and ensure clear d differentiation between the service provider and client users. Interested in a business plan? Well, Bitwarden has plans that will work for you. Their Teams organization option is just $3 a month per user where you can share private data securely with your coworkers, your department, or an entire organization. Now, for enterprises, use Bitwarden's enterprise organization plan for just $5 a month per user. Their free organization plan includes two users who can store and share secure passwords. Now, Bitwarden believes that everyone should have access to basic password security tools. Now, individuals can use their basic free account forever for an individual on unlimited number of passwords or upgrade anytime to their premium account for less than a dollar a month. And if you're looking for secure password storage for the entire family, well, the family organization option gives up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. Using Bitwarden Cloud, you can get started in no time. That's right. Monitor and manage security vulnerabilities using the Bitwarden Vault Health Reports. Identify exposed, reused, weak, or potentially compromised passwords, as well as any items in your vault with inactive 2FA. Get started with a free Teams or Enterprise trial of Teams or Enterprise plan at bitwarden.com slash twit, or try it for free across devices as an individual user. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. And we thank Bitwarden for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Chris Beatty. He's the CIO of ServiceNow. We're talking about a little bit how low code and no code solutions have just been revolutionizing organizations and even a lot of the roles within organizations. Now, Chibert, I, I, I want to bring you back in because obviously, you know, this is changing not just IT roles out there as well. Yeah, and I'd like to propose my dream my dream you know my my career was all about listening to people i'd go in and learn how to do a process i always tell my customers you know when i was developing systems for them teach me how it's done manually and once i learned that then i can go and automate it for you low code no code sounds like we're moving the development capabilities closer to the subject matter expert. In fact, I'm proposing a title for the show is low code pundits. And I think that's going to be really cool. You know, I'm starting to, I started to see it at the university of Hawaii when I was there that we were actually teaching an IOT development class inside of oceanography because things like Python made it a lot easier to develop systems. So in this case, we were teaching them how to develop their own instrumentation. I'm seeing low code, no code as doing the same thing for the business process. So I guess what I'm going to ask Chris is, do you like my title for one? And two, do you think that's really what low code, no code is doing? Is the IT group going to be the integrator so we can do the complex pieces of 
getting things to talk to each other. But now the development isn't going to be driven directly by IT. It's going to be driven by the subject matter experts. What do you think? Wow, there was a lot there. First off, an easy one. I love the title. Um, and then you talked about putting the power in the hands of the people that know the domain the most. I think that is absolutely one of the things that low code, no code can enable. And back to my point around the people closest to the action, they don't want to have to call a central organization to make the work better. They want to just do it themselves because they know it the best. So I, and I think we've seen that play out at multiple organizations. So for example, Airbus uses our technology ServiceNow's low code, no code platform. And in less than 90 days, they built an app in the manufacturing domain by subject matters closest to the action that help reduce the number of issues or issue incidents in this space by 20%. You have an organization, a financial services institution like Intercontinental Exchange, the same thing, the domain experts are building these apps. They tripled their development capacity. So we're seeing this all over the place in terms of the, the, the power really being put in hands of the talent that we have across our organization. Now, what's the impact on IT? I think it's positive. I think the impact is IT doesn't go away. IT doesn't become less important. I think I love the word enabler. IT needs to enable the talent across the organization to unlock their creativity to really help their organizations transform. And as a result, the whole company transform. And what it allows IT to do is focus on the real complex and hairy problems where they really have to dig in. And maybe it's some with some super sensitive data where we just can't mess it up from a cyber or data risk standpoint and focus on those types of things. But the one important thing, there's multiple important things, but the one important thing I'll highlight is it needs to be a continuum because maybe there's a low code, no code use case that's developed in a department and somebody goes, wait a second, all 20,000 people at our organization could use that, but maybe we need to harden it a little bit. And so the ability in one platform to move from low code, no code to pro code becomes really, really important. And having that be a continuous fabric, I think is one of the critical success factors. Okay. So one of the questions that we always get asked of any quote new system coming out, how secure is it? So we've had a lot of conversations about modules, DLLs and things like that, uh, mm -hmm. dependencies within programming systems that had errors in them and vulnerabilities. Yeah. So some people might say, well, a low code, no code system means there's more room for vulnerabilities, but I kind of stick something on the other side of the scale saying, well, but if we're using the low code, no code tools, we can concentrate more on making those tools more secure and make sure the code it creates is more secure. So what side of the scale do you guys want to be on? Yeah, I, I think it's a great point. And if you talk to anybody um, in technology or across the enterprise today, they'll tell you, hey, low code, no code, I don't know, maybe it's insecure, it's going to create a bunch of tech debt. And all those things could be true if they're not managed proactively. So I think on, on the security front, um, and also to, I'll, I'll talk about it as general risk. As you're pushing a low code, no code agenda and enabling all the talent, there is no way to expect that the talent is going to be as well versed in secure coding practices, how to manage data and all those sorts of things that an IT organization is used to. So the key part of the enablement and part of any citizen development program needs to become a couple things. Give them trusted data sets that they can operate with um, that are curated with all the right security controls built in for PII so they don't have to think about it. They can just use it with confidence knowing that the central organization is making it secure. And along the way, we talk about DevOps and CI, CD. And again, we can't expect a citizen developer to know about that, but building into the platform the right, I'll use the word governance or guardrails to, so that there's automated security scans happening all along the way. And that the central IT organization still has a role to play before you push something to production. So while all those automated scans are running and things like that, having a check at the end to make sure you're not incurring a higher level of risk than you want 
with cyber or data or anything like that. I think that's absolutely critical and it's a super important point. But I do think that for maybe years, we've resisted the low code, no code thing because of fear of tech debt, fear of security. And I think IT leaders have three choices today with low code, no code. The first is try and block it. And I, I don't think that's a, that's a winning um, scenario simply because people will find their ways around whatever we put in place to block it. Um, the second is it's happening out there in your departments anyway, ignore it. That's not a good recipe for success because of the cyber and various data risks that I mentioned. The only logical choice from my mind is embrace it and therefore be proactive about it and put in a program that has the guardrails you want with cyber data integrations, et cetera, but still empowers the talent at your company. Now, Chris, I do want to shift it just a bit because I think that we hear this this new term in the industry of the concept of a what we call a citizen developer. Obviously, citizen developer. There's this new one coming out as the citizen data scientist, um, and you know that they add these the term citizen be, before a very professional term like developer or data scientist. And there's sometimes a, a disparity between the two. Like, should we be worried that maybe citizen data scientists, citizen developers will be taking place of the traditional roles that you have. And I think you said, hey, let's go and enable, empower people in an organization that might have domain expertise, but not necessarily programming expertise to actually implement um, special processes and workflows in the system. But I think there's that other side of things of people who who might have a little bit of domain expertise, but also have to go or did go and learn programming or some kind of a language um, like, for instance, Go, C++, C Sharp, that kind of thing in order to go and maintain their um, their technical role uh, in an organization, should they be worried about low code or no code, or is it is it something that will just in, in enhance their role? I think the short answer is no, but let me unpack that a bit. I think there's an sure. estimate I read that in the next three to five years, about 500 million new apps will get developed in the in, in enterprises. 500 million. There is no way a central tech organization can build all of those, and you have a workforce that's ready to play in this domain. Um, so one is the necessity is there. The second thing I would say is I think the wariness comes about in two fronts. One is, is this doing something to my role and my job that I don't like? The second is, will low code, no code citizen developers actually do anything real? And let me touch on that one first. So I think regardless of the programming language evolution, whether it was assembly to Fortran, Fortran to C, C to Java, Java to JavaScript, Whenever there was a new programming language that abstracted a bit of the complexity of the previous one, the people that were used to the previous one always were a bit skeptical. Can they actually do anything real? And I did the same. I grew up on C and C++ as a computer engineer, Java, JavaScript, these new languages came out. I'm like, eh, I don't know if they're sophisticated enough to handle real workloads. And I, so I think history has proven that low code, no code will handle real workloads if it follows a pattern of the past. And it is the second thing that you mentioned, which is, does this do something to my job? And I would just say the short answer is no, regardless of which way you look at it, you could use some of my stats of the 500 million apps, the well-documented shortage of labor with programming skills, the insatiable desire around digital transformation. You add up all that there is more than enough work. And I think what we need is this continuum again from low code, no code citizen developers and the pro code people, if I could use that term, need to handle the big enterprise wide use cases, enterprise wide problems, which require deep programming at scale, deliver digital products and services, leveraging machine learning, integrating IoT, which you were talking about earlier with the right cybersecurity posture. So I don't think there's any replacement of a central IT organization. It's definitely an and, not an or. So Chris, let me tell you a fast story about a project I did with an 11 year old girl just before I retired from the University of Hawaii. She wanted to develop a more humane feral cat trap, but she didn't, quite know how. So as an IT specialist, I enabled her by teaching her about a no-code solution. In this case, it was Cayenne. Mm -hmm. 
so that she could go and censor a um, feral cat trap to tell her immediately through an SMS message when it caught a cat so that the cat doesn't suffer because they get dehydrated. I think we need to go and, as an industry, push the low code, no code further down to our children because I think they're the ones that are going to get this experience and they're going to be developing the world of tomorrow. And so my question for you actually is, is service now reaching out to the high schools and younger? Um, do you think that's appropriate? Do you want to see that kind of world happen? Yeah, first off on your macro point, and maybe a little bit of nuance and you might disagree. Um, and I love the example. I think the workforce that's in high school today when they're doing those types of things, they don't think of it as programming. They don't think of it as development. These are just things they've grown up with. And you know, why wouldn't I put this, 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 and that together to build, you know, the, the cat solution that you just mentioned. Um, so, and I, so I do think people entering the workforce are more equipped for a low code, no code because they're digital natives. This is stuff that they've grown up with on is service now service now. We, we have something called now learning. It's an external portal that, that by the way, we use it internally too for our citizen developers, but reaching out and anybody can go on there and, and quickly get proficient in service now's low code, no code solutions and platforms. They can go to our developer portal, download a service now instance, start developing on it. Um, and, and just start playing around, which is how kids learn. So. Um, we are active out there in terms of getting the community um, and up leveling skill sets and things like that um, for the workforce entering, you know, um, companies today and for the workforce inside companies. As I mentioned, we serve 80 percent of the Fortune 500. We're working with all of them on their low code, no code programs and figuring out how they enable their talent. That sounds really encouraging. I. I'd like to set a challenge to our viewers. Take a good hard look at what ServiceNow has. The idea is there's some absolutely stunning ideas out in the world by people that are subject matter experts, that people are closer to the problems. Um, but there's not been enough IT trained, you know, trained IT people to go and develop those apps. We just don't have enough cycles to be able to do it. And I think low code, no code is going to enable the paradigm shift in the way we do business, in the way we teach, in the way we do science. And uh, I'm quite encouraged by our conversation with uh, Mr. Beatty because this, I see, is the future. And that's the reason why I was proposing, yeah, low-code pundits might be a good title for the show. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Chris, before we before we sign out here, I do have one one quick question, maybe a crystal ball question for you. Um, you know, we I mentioned this before. You know, obviously, you know, organizations they're building these low code, no code solutions. They're building out their workflows. They're starting to ingest a lot more data, and now they want to do analytics on that data. So, is there maybe some citizen? Uh, developers, data scientists, um, you know, potential solutions for them coming down the pipe anytime soon. Lou, you hit, you hit a topic where like near and dear to my heart, and I'd love to come back and talk about analytics, machine learning, and all of that in depth. But here's the thing. Um, I do believe that applications, whether it's developed by pro code or citizen developers, they have to have the analytics embedded within them. So one of the things, just as an example, in our platform, what we've done, if you've developed an app, let's say you're a citizen developer on our platform, we have process mining, process optimization running in the background. It will surface to you insights saying, with people using this app that you've developed, you should tweak it here. And if you tweak it here, people will be a lot happier. It'll, the process will go that much faster. So the whole concept being that the platforms should start telling the citizen developers what to go build next, what to go do next. And I think that's going to be yet another paradigm shift as opposed to people finding the problems, the platforms start to surface the problems automatically. 
Fantastic. Well, folks, all good things must come to an end. Chris, you, thank you so much for being here. Really great topics. We'll definitely have to have you come back and talk more about that. But, you know, we did want to give you a chance to maybe tell the folks at home where they can learn more about ServiceNow and maybe how they can get started. Well, I would, if you're interested in low code, no code, I would simply go to the servicenow.com website, the developer portal. You can download an instance. You can start playing around with it. If you're out there and you're a ServiceNow customer, certainly reach out through your team, the ServiceNow team that supports you, or reach out to me directly. As you can tell, I'm passionate about the topic. Would love to be a helping hand for you to get started. And thanks again for having me. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best thing, Enterpod podcast in the universe. Definitely tune your podcast, you're too quiet. I do want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host. That's right, Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, what's going on for you in the coming weeks and where can people find you? I'm unpacking boxes, more and more <laughs> boxes. But you know what? I'm finding out all kinds of really cool things that we packed up and trying to design some new projects. So hopefully I'll be sharing that on Twitter. And you know what? My Twitter address is A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. And I'd love to hear your show ideas. We've had some great ones. And we're doing a few paradigm shifts within the uh, booking so that we can get more host-driven conversations. And we'll see how that goes. And you know what? You're also welcome to throw show ideas at Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv. Throw the show ideas at me, uh, PR folks, throw the pitches at me so that I can keep track of them and make sure that you don't fall between the cracks. But if you want to go and hit a question or comment to all the hosts, you're also welcome to send an email to twiet at twit.tv and we'd love to hear from you. And yes, for our viewers that are in other countries, if English isn't your first language, as long as you're willing to work with us, we'll go and try and use Microsoft or Google Translate or something like that to answer your questions just the same. I've done a bunch and life was interesting. And it's nice to hear the perspectives from the folks outside of the United States. Indeed. Thank you, Chebert. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show and get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise and IT news. Go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet, though. You'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, our guest information, of course, the links of the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos there, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version of video version of your choice and listen on any one of your devices and on any one of your podcast applications, podcatcher applications out there, Apple podcast, YouTube, you name it. We are out there. Definitely subscribe, support the show. Now you may have also heard, we also have club twit. That's right. It's a members only ad free podcast service with a bonus twit plus feed that you can, you can't really get anywhere else. And it's only $7 per month. Now, one of my favorite things that you get with that club twit is the exclusive access to the members only discord channel. That's right. Some really fun characters in there. Great conversations, masters of, of the animated gifts are in there. We also have a lot of fun topics and, and behind the scenes that we talk about in there. Um, all the shows and hosts are in there. Definitely check it out. It's a really great place to be. Join club twit be part of that movement go to twit.tv slash club twit now club twit now offers corporate group plans as well that's right it's a great way to give your team access to our ad free tech podcast the plans start with five members at a discounted rate of six dollars each per month and you can add as many seats as you like this is a great way for your it department your developers tech teams it to stay on top of stay on top of all the latest technologies and all the latest podcast that we do here on Twit. And just like regular memberships, they can join that Twit Discord server as well and get that Twit Plus bonus feed as well. So definitely join and learn about that at twit.tv slash club twit. But you know what? You might also like a la carte as well. There's there's also another option. That's right. The Twit Twit has actually partnered with Apple Podcasts to make it easy for you to actually pick individual shows for ad free, free viewing. And all you have to do is single show subscriptions through Apple Podcasts. It's only two dollars and ninety nine cents per month per show, and you get to pick whatever show you want. And you, you basically just 
get that ad free content. It's great, great option for you. Lots of options. Definitely check that out. Now, after you subscribe, you can impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twy because we talk about a lot about fun tech topics on this show, and I guarantee they will find it fun and interesting as well. So definitely share it with them. Now, if you've subscribed and you're available on Friday, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, we do this show live. That's right. We're on the live stream right now. You can go check that out at twit.tv slash live. Come see how the pizza is made, the behind the scenes. Come see how the show is run, all the fun and interesting things we do behind the scenes. Come check that out. Plus, Plus, if you're going to watch the show live, we also have an IRC channel. It's been around for a long time. A lot of great characters in there. PC Guy, Tech Dino, Chicken Head. They're all in there. Loquacious. You know, we have a lot of great topics that we talk about in there. So definitely check that out. IRC.twit.tv. Now, you know what? Definitely hit me up on Twitter. Lou MM, I'm on there. We we always like to talk pro, no, podcast, tech, enterprise. Definitely DM me for show ideas. Check it out. Lots of great things that we post on there. Of course, lately I've been posting a little bit of my uh, my issues with uh, with my network and some uh, qualms I have with some of those companies. But you know what? You know, a lot of times it's more interesting than that. So definitely check that out. And of course, you want to check out what I do normally at my workday uh, at Microsoft. Definitely check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post the latest and greatest ways for you to customize your office solution and make it more productive for you. And in fact, a new way to actually create macros. That's right. For, for your online documents in Excel, we have a new way to actually generate TypeScript for your, for, for your documents and actually be able to run macros in the cloud. That's right. So check that out. It's called Office Script. So check it out. New way to create macros. Now, I, I do want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we really couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for all their support all over all these years. Of course, I want to thank all the staff at Twit. And of course, I want to thank Mr. Brian G. One more time. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the bookings and the plannings for the show and really couldn't do the show without him. So thank you, Cheaper, for all your support. And of course, before we sign out, I do want to thank our our TD for today. He's Mr. Victor B. Victor, it's great to have you back in studio. Great to see you again. What's going on for you in the coming weeks on Twit? Uh, not not much. Just the usual. Uh, working on this show, and uh, uh, I'm here in place of Ant, letting Ant get some time off. And uh, uh, I also work on uh, hands-on photography with Ant. So check out that show too. It's it's always really fun. Absolutely. Which it's a this great week show. He interviewed, and he interviewed um an expert on uh pet photography, which was which was Ooh, really interesting. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I always I always learn something new from that every week. In fact, I find myself taking even more photos and wasting even more memory cards just so I can try some of that stuff out. So definitely check out Hands On Photography with Ann Pruitt and of course all the shows here on Twip. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresco just reminding you if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep twine. If you find yourself talking to those virtual assistants in your house quite often, or maybe you can make your light turn on and off with the touch of a button, well, Smart Tech Today is the show for you. Join Matthew Casanelli and myself, Micah Sargent, every week as we talk all about smart stuff and the fun that comes along with it. <laughs>